Hey programmers, Alvin here. Welcome back to the second day in the Advent of Code Challenge. And so let's jump right into things. Naturally, we're gonna be talking about uh, the solution for day two. So you'll want to definitely maybe pause the video, give the problem a shot on your own first, and then come uh, back to this walkthrough. So you've been warned, we will go over the walkthrough right now. And so to get going for this problem, uh, the main gist is we're gonna be given some data that represents uh, maybe some information like a database about passwords. And so here I just have some example input. So we'll call this uh, three separate lines. And it's really how they give you the input in the first place. It's just a plain text file uh, where you have different lines separated. And so we'll refer to each of these lines as a separate row of our data set. And if we interpret a single row, if you look at the first chunk of information, like this first one of 1-3, that represents a range, right? So a minimum and maximum. And the second part of every row would be uh, the character that we're targeting. And the third part would just be our actual password data. And so what we're asked to do for every row in our data set is to determine, uh, does the character have a number of occurrences in the password that is somewhere in the range? So for example, if I looked at the very first row over here, I basically am asking, you know, how many times does A appear in my password? Right now, it appears once. One is indeed in the range between a one and three, and so I would actually verify that first row as being true, right? So it's a valid password, we'll say. In a similar sense, if I look at the second row, I would count the number of occurrences of B within my password. B actually appears zero times right now, uh, but the range is specifying one to three times. And so we'll actually say false or invalid uh, password two is not correct. And the same thing follows for the third example. Here I have nine C's, and it does look like my range includes nine, right? So one thing we'll notice is for uh, the inputs that they give us, the minimum value is inclusive as well as the maximum value is also inclusive. Cool, so overall I have uh, two valid passwords and then one uh, invalid one. And so in the grand scheme of uh, the problem, they really just want us to return the count of the number of valid passwords in our input. So here the answer would be two, right? Because there are two uh, valid lines. And so this problem seems very manageable, but why don't we also talk about the complexity of this? So since we're dealing with a few different kind of uh, variables in our complexity, let's define them. So I'll start by saying that N is going to be my number of lines in my data set. Then along with that, I know they can also give me different like password strings and they can also vary in their length. So then I'll also say that M is the maximal password length. I'm gonna use these two terms to define my complexity because I know that they would both contribute to the runtime. Let's begin with the time complexity. So I know that we're gonna to have to look at every line of our data set. So I'm gonna have at least O of N time. But along with that, as I interpret a single uh, line of my data set, I also have to count how many times the character appears in the password on that line or the string. And if I have to you know, count the number of times something occurs in the string, I must iterate through the entire string. If a given string is gonna have at most M characters, then I think our overall time complexity looks something like N times M. And in a similar way, I can kind of foresee us having to use also uh, n times m space because we're gonna have to separate the data in the input file. And so overall, we're looking at a fairly sufficient solution out of the gate, right? It looks like we're gonna have a linear time complexity. And overall, since there are two variables, this is actually a form of a multilinear, which is uh, not gonna take too long if we ever ran this on some large inputs. So you're probably recognizing that this problem is pretty straightforward, maybe even more straightforward uh, than day one's problem. And I totally agree, uh, but this is one of those problems where maybe we'll want to design our code in a clean way. There are definitely a lot of tedious operations to do in a problem like this. So maybe it helps to just plan things as we go. So why don't we maybe take more of a nod to the implementation details of this solution now. So one thing that's kind of unfortunate in this problem is the fact that all of our input data is just given as plain text. So I basically am given just a file where every line contains some information about uh, someone's password, right? Or what it should be rather. And so instead of just having you know these long strings, right? I know I can separate every line into its own string. So I think it would be really helpful here if we actually took each line of our a file and we parsed it into some more meaningful data fields. In other words, it'd be nice if I maybe have a JavaScript object that represents uh, each line of my input. So I'm gonna format the data into a few uh, different properties. 
I think when it comes to the properties, they're really straightforward. I should have a min, a max, a char, and password. Min and max would just be like the number parts of the range. In other words, in the grand scheme of things, after I kind of populate all of the different fields for each line, I wanna make sure that the character appears in the password uh, somewhere between a min and max a number of times. And so that is uh, nothing too fancy at all. And something that we'll definitely want to do along the way is to consider building uh, maybe one more thing, possibly a helper function. Uh, I'll call it char count, and what it should do is take in some target character as well as some string, and straightforward enough, it should just return a count. In other words, I wish this helper function uh, would take in something like p as well as potato, and just return the number of times that p appears inside of the potato string. So that would be one. In a similar way, if I use char count to look for t inside a potato, that should return me two. And finally, if I wanted to find the number of times of z in potato, that should return just a simple zero. So I think that's all there is to this problem. Let's actually head into my editor and we'll code this one up together. All right, so here I have my input file. Notice that contains uh, many different lines, but every line does follow the format that we just described. If you're following along, you'll wanna download your own specific uh, input file from the admins of code site. And so let's just start by maybe formatting this data into JavaScript objects, that way I can operate on them more easily. So here I have my classic function that just reads uh, the lines of my text file. I'll just call that function. And let's just go ahead and maybe just see the lines we get back. So that's just gonna be an array of some strings, I think, right? So I'll print that out, see what that looks like to start. So I'm gonna run part one. And there I see my lines. And let me start by turning each of these lines or each of these strings into a nice object. So I think the move here would be to maybe create a helper function that I'll just repeatedly call on every uh, string of this array. So I'll create over here, I'll say const, and I'll say, I don't know, create uh, object. It's gonna create an object uh, from a line. Uh, this doesn't need to be asynchronous because I'm just going to do uh, some regular JavaScript code. So I think of the formatting here, let's start by just uh, splitting up the three main sections. So I have like the range part, as well as the character part, and then the actual password part. And I see that they're all separated right now by a space. So that'll be a great initial way to start teasing the info out of these lines. So I'll say align.split. So again, I'm assuming that line is going to be just one of these strings. So I'm gonna split on a space. And that should give me my three pieces. I'll just name them into variables. I'll use some destructuring syntax. So maybe we'll call part one the, I don't know, range segment, I'll say range seg. Then we have the character segment, as well as the, I'll say password segment. If I wanted to test just this individual function in isolation, I can just maybe copy one of these inputs. Let's say this one, and I'll just call uh, my function on it. Let's see what we get back. I'll console.log all of these segments. And I guess I can also comment out, uh, I don't need to call my main solve function quite yet. So are we able to just split things up in a proper shape? Let me bring that up a little bit. Nice, so that makes sense. I have my pieces here, um, but then I need to actually get at the inner data within each of these segments. So I wanna get like the min and max from this range. So what I can do is I think just split again on a dash. So I can say maybe const, I'll destructure here. I'll say get the min value and the um, max value by doing range seg dot split on a dash now. So let me just make sure that gives me the correct min and max, I like to test my code as I go. So does that give me correct data? Um, so I'm missing some quotes here. Splitting on just the dash, right? Nice, so I have two and 14, which does make sense for this particular uh, single line. I wanna make sure that those are also uh, numbers. So I should convert them to be super sure. So I'm gonna map over the array that I get back from the split and just turn everything into a number. So now I'll have the nice number data. Cause I know in the long run, I need to check if you know the number of occurrences is between those numbers. So I need to do some actual number operators. Uh, this is looking pretty good. Now let's consume the character segment. So I believe if we were to print out the character segment, in this case, it should just be the C followed by the colon. And I think we wanna get rid of that colon part. 
So then I'll just maybe say over here, the character is really just going to be the char segment at index zero, nothing too fancy over here. All right, so that part's easy. And I think the password segment is already good to go. Maybe I'll just call this one password because it's, it's already in its uh, final form. So what does that look like? The password should just be this string, starts with fr. Yep, and there it is. Awesome. So I think at this point, I just need to package all of this information up and return a nice object. So over in this helper function, create object, I'll just return an object where I'll have the min followed by the max, followed by the char, followed by the password. So just using some JavaScript syntax here, I'm creating an object. Uh, if I just say min, it will take the key and make min the literal key, but then its value will be whatever the variable contains, right? So in this example, min is two. This creates a key of min, but its value is two. In other words, if I console.log, the object I get back here should be that nice uh, formatted object. Perfect. And so we can get rid of this little test code and we can start working in our, our main function. So I know I have a way to turn every single align into a nice object. And I want to you know, check the number of occurrences of a character appearing within the password. So maybe I'll also make that helper function separately. So we'll say I create that char count helper that I mentioned in our whiteboard. I'm looking for some target among some regular string. This one's pretty straightforward. So I'm gonna start by initializing a count variable, set equal to zero. Then I'll iterate through every character of the string. So I'll say for let char of string. And then as I iterate, I'm gonna check if that character is equal to the target, right? And if it is, then I'll increment my count. And after I'm done iterating through the entire string, I'll just return the count. So I wanna test this in isolation. I'll say, what's the char count of P in potato? And then what's the count of T in potato? So I should get, looks like one and two respectively, right? Let's see that. All right, nice. So that helper function looks like it's good to go. So now I think we're ready to finally put all of these pieces together. So I know in the long run, I want to return the count of the lines that are valid, that represent valid passwords. I should be able to get 528 if this works properly. And so for every line, I'm gonna to have to iterate through them. So maybe I'll just say for let line of lines, and then I'm going to just convert everything into an object. So I'll create an object from that line. And once I do that, then I have access to all of the, the nice fields. So I can just pluck out, let's say, so I can do some object destructure. I can pluck out the min, the max, and the char, and the password. Nice. And then uh, once I have that, then I can just run my main logic, right? So what I'll do is, why don't we check if the char count of the character and the password is in the given range. I think I'm gonna to have to repeat this expression twice over, so we should probably save this in a variable. So I'll call this my count. Nice. Then I wanna check if this count is um, greater than or equal to min, but less than or equal to max, right? It has to be somewhere within that range. So straightforward enough, I could just check min, less than or equal to count, or, or rather I should say and, and I'll say count less than or equal to max. And I was sure to make min and max numbers. Nice. So if the count is within our given range, then I should um, include this particular line in my actual output. So I just want to consider into my total. So I'll say let number valid. So it starts at zero. Every time I find a password whose count is in the specified range, then I'll just increment numvalid. Nice. And then after I'm done doing that for every line, I'll just return numvalid. Pretty happy with this code. I guess I could also use map here, but I think I'll just keep it as it is. So let's give this a shot now. Now I'm running my solve method. I'm just printing out its return value. Nice, and there we have the 528.
So there we have a solution to day two, uh, part one. Like we mentioned, we have to consider uh, the complexity within this char count method. So if m is the uh, size of the longest string, then we'd have m time in this char count, and we call that function for every line. If there are n lines, and overall we're looking at n times m time complexity. I think with that, let's head back into the drawing board for part two. All right, let's work on part two now. As always, there are spoilers ahead. And so in part two, we wanna take in uh, really the same data file, but this time we're gonna interpret uh, the information in a little different kind of way. And so let's say we wanted to validate our first line of input. Basically, what we have to do is now interpret the first chunk of information, that is the 1-3, as no longer a range, but instead as two separate positions. So 1, 3 really refers to position 1 and also position 3. So bear in mind that the uh, numbers they give us represent here uh, positions that begin at 1, right? So the A it has position 1, although, you know, programmatically we know it has index 0. And with those two target positions, now we want to verify, uh, does the letter A appear just exactly in one of these positions, right? So if I look at that, I see that A is definitely, you know, only at one position of my input right now. And so that would be a valid password. In a similar way, if you look at the second row, I'm still looking at uh, positions one and three, but this time I'm asking, does B occur exactly once at these positions? And since B appears zero times at these positions, then I say false, right? This is not a valid password. Finally, for my uh, last input, I actually have C and I'm looking at positions two and nine. And I'm asking, uh, does C occur exactly one of these positions? And it's actually both of these positions, which means that we should actually invalidate this password as well. Uh, we want exactly one of the positions to have it. So that means zero is not good enough. And also a two is also not good enough. We need exactly one. And so that's going to be some interesting logic uh, to establish, not very complex uh, at all. Similar to part one, what we want to do is really return the number that represents the counts of lines or passwords that are valid here. So the answer we should give back is one in this instance. And so we can already probably foresee that in this second part, uh, we really have probably an easier algorithm in terms of its complexity. If we say that n is the number of lines in our data set, then technically now uh, we just do some indexing at our given passwords, right? So I don't need to actually iterate through my passwords. So I think that overall uh, the time complexity seems to be just O of N, right? I should not have to iterate individually through every character of a password. I can just look at those indices directly. And so if we get that out of the way, I think the only other thing we might have to maybe think about for now is how we should format the data. So like before, we're still given, you know, these different lines of our input. And if we, you know, went about the, the same route and created maybe objects that represent each of them, we might want to maybe adjust the format of things here. So no longer min and max. Instead, we'll call them position one, position two. Uh, but then along with that, because our input contains like one indexed positions, I know all my programs use zero starting indices. And so maybe we'll just adjust that by maybe finessing our data, and maybe subtracting all of my positions by one. That way I have things that begin at zero, which will be more useful for me to implement some code about. So I think with that, we're ready to code this one up. Let's hop to it. All right, let's work on part two now. So I think we're gonna be able to borrow a lot of the code from part one. So I think we're definitely gonna still use the create object helper function. Just to get some nice properties out of each line. But we're gonna to have to probably finesse it a little bit. So for the min and max, that's no longer appropriate names. That will be maybe position one, and then also position two, right? And then from there, I'll kind of work those into my object, position one, position two. And then don't forget, uh, in the context of our actual lines of the file, these represent positions that uh, begin their count at one. So in other words, if I have, let's say, index or rather position one over here, that refers to index zero in the programmatic sense. So I have that kind of off by one thing here. So I'll just correct it, I guess, in this object. So I'll go ahead and say position one should actually be position one minus one. So I'm just gonna decrement those positions to give me uh, valid indices. Nice. So I think this is good. And now we can start just working on our, our main part of our function. So let's start by iterating through every line again. So we'll say 
for let line of lines. I'm going to do the same thing by calling create object on that line. I'll give me back my properties. So I'll just deconstruct them out of this. And in this second part of day two, what we want to do is make sure that the character only occurs at exactly one of these positions in the password. So I'm going to use an if else statement here. So let's just start by checking or possibly just an if statement. So let's just set up some logic where we can check if the character appears at either position one or position two, right? So that's straightforward. I can just check, hey, is the password, remember that's just a string, password at this first index, if that's equal to char, right? And I'll just say, or same thing, but for position two. So nothing fancy here. This just checks um, if the character is at either of those positions, right? However, if you write code like this, this would also be true um, if both position one and position two had the character, which I want to avoid, right? They only want exactly one of the positions. So let me go ahead and initialize my total variable. So I'll say num valid. And what I want to express is if either of these clauses are true, but not both. So something quite literal I can do is just say, and not both. So I can say, and, and then kind of repeat these expressions. So I'll copy this and I'll say, and not, and I have the same expression basically, but I and them together. So let me squeeze this over a little bit. So how do I read this total expression? If I add the parentheses in the valid place, well, it's a little more clear if I wrap this up. So basically, if my character appears at either position and not both positions, right? I think with longer expressions like this, I'd probably prefer to maybe save these into variables. So maybe it's a little more clean if I even took this guy and said is at position one. And then I'll do the similar expression is at position two. And then I can just refactor all of this code, right? Now, these expressions are is at position one. And then these are is at position two. We have a little cleanup to do over here to take out this uh, equal sign now. So I already have those booleans. Nice. So uh, if I have my character at position one or position two and not both of them, right? So if that's the case, then I'm allowed to increment my num valid because this must be a, a valid password, right? And actually, otherwise, if this is not true, then I don't need to do anything. Basically, I don't increment. Finally, I'll just return my num valid. So let's give uh, this one a shot. It should get 497. Nice, and there we have our expected answer of 497. So that's really all there is to this problem. I don't think that part two is uh, really at all harder than uh, part one, but it does sort of offer a pretty classic programming pattern just in terms of uh, logical statements in that we want a scenario where either condition is true, but not both. It's very reminiscent to classic problems like FizzBuzz and stuff like that. But overall, I think that wraps up everything for day two, and I'll catch you tomorrow for day three of the advent of code.